I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, we thank the Lord because this is the day that the Lord has made. We are glad, we rejoice, and we will flourish in this day no matter what it looks like, seems like, or feels like in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, we thank God. I invite all the men. I honor the grace upon men and women of God. Even some of those that are gathered with us from Kenya, you're welcome. In Jesus' name, I'm from all over you are gathering from we welcome you as we seek the lord in this hour um and right now we're going to be talking about um altars and i can start by saying that the bible opens up with an altar from the very beginning of genesis the bible starts with an altar and guess what? Even in the book of Revelation, we are still told of, of altars existing in the book of Revelation. So we're going to start from there. And uh, um, I know that um, um, altars, I mean, definitions determine interpretations. So when we talk about the word altar comes from a Hebrew word, misbeh, which means... Um, a place of sacrifice a place of sacrifice an elevated place consecrated for a deity it's a place of sacrifice now before i go any further i want you to understand that there are stationary altars and they also there are moving altars there are altars that are stationary there are altars that are moving old mobile altars um so when there is a designated place that a person designates for god like a church where you gather that's a designated stationary place where people come and connect to you know order and it's a system of spiritual transaction where people come and to connect with God. They have consecrated that place to God. So in as much as that's why I said it's a, an altar is an elevated place of sacrifice. Elect, um, erected or raised to a deity. Could be God or a spirit. A different spirit. The spirit of God. And they are stationary and mobile altars. There is a mobile altar which alters in or mobile altars in various categories number one there is the initial mobile altar we see in romans chapter 12 and uh, it says brethren present your bodies a living sacrifice sacrifice holy and acceptable unto god which is your reasonable act of worship present your bodies i urge you i beg you by the masses of god present your bodies a living sacrifice now we understand that when you get to talk about sacrifice there is no sacrifice that is asked for they you can the place of sacrifice is a place an old of an altar so when we come to the throne of God on a daily basis into the presence of God, Paul is saying, present your bodies a living sacrifice. So wherever there is an altar, it's a place of sacrifice. So whenever you talk about of a sacrifice, you can never detach a sacrifice to an altar. Now, the use of altars, before I go any further, this, the mo that mobile altar initially is what you see in first corinthians 3 the bible says don't you know that your bodies are a temple of the spirit of the living god so an altar is found in a temple as a place consecrated to god so this body of yours and mine is a temple and the Bible says that you have been bought at a price. You're no longer your own. This body is no longer your own. It's now the temple of the Holy Spirit of the living God. 
And the Bible says, whoever destroys this body, him God shall also destroy. So your body is not your body. It is the temple. If you are born again Christian, this is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, in every temple, there is a consecrated place that's ordained for God. A place ordained for God. Now, we understand that place in this temple of yours, the real altar is your heart. Your real altar is the real altar is the heart because it's a meeting place with God. So you being a mobile altar, that's why wherever you move, you move with the, with the heaven. You move with the presence of God. Somebody say amen. Now, that being said, I wanted you to see the altar in various perspectives before we dig deeper into the teaching. I'm just preparing you to understand. Now, there are people that have erected stationary places like like in the church, that altar, the place, the church in itself, not only the pulpit, the place that you have, is a, a place you have elect, er, er, um, erected unto God, raised unto God, and you have said, this place will sanctify. It's a place out of the many places that you have consecrated. The word consecration is a biblical terminology that means it was set apart as a holy for for God so you've set that entire church you have set that place as an altar unto Jehovah God and you have come into agreement with God that this is the place we will be meeting with you so there is that altar as a church the corporate there is corporate altars they are personal altar. Your church is a corporate altar. But what empowers the corporate altar is the personal altar. There is a personal altar, your personal altar, the family altar where you meet as a family. Now your personal altar determines the strength of your family altar. Your family altar is what determines the strength and the influence of your cooperate altar where you go to meet, especially in us as ministers, if you're a man of God, if you're a woman of God, or a worshiper, or any person that serves in the sanctuary. If your personal altar is contaminated, you transfer poison and contamination. When you go to meet with other people, you you pour you release poison not life so that's why the initial you paul uses this terminology saying brethren i urge you by the mercies of god he is pleading with people i beg you by the mercies of god present your bodies on a daily basis and that word present is not a one time thing it is a continuous present continuous thing on a daily basis, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship. You can't discern the will of God until you have actually come to a place of sacrifice where you sacrifice. Now, when the Bible says present your body as a living sacrifice, it's talking about your heart initially and because the heart in the bible denotes conduct character behavior and attitudes if you look at your bible in um, in the book of romans in that same romans chapter 12 and i want to read it to you romans chapter 12 and i'm going to read it to you from the the from the uh, the message bible and when you read from the message bible it reads like this it says so here's what i want you to do god helping you take your everyday life so to present your body what it means is to take your everyday life your ordinary life 
And the Bible, what I'm, I'm speaking now, I'm reading from the Word. It is there. Romans 12, verse 1 in the, in the Message Bible. What it means to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, which heaven recognizes as true worship. It says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, your ordinary life, that is your sleeping life. Take your sleeping life. Take your eating life. Going, take your going to work life. And your walking around life. And place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Embracing. What God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Now, to present your body a living sacrifice means to take your everyday life. Now, it is easier to say, Lord, I give you, and to sing it. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. But you are mocking God when your everyday life is not in sync with your confession. You are a hypocrite. That's what the bad Jesus says. These people honor me with their lips, but I don't have the heart. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are very far away. So it's not worship until the heart is involved. And the heart is your daily lifestyle. That is take your everyday life, your ordinary life. It is broken down there for you. You take your sleeping life. There are people who will never meet God because they love sleep more than they love God. There are people that love food more than God. Their eating life has become their very own enemy from encountering God. If you cannot constrain your appetite, <laughs> the Bible says that a man who restrains himself, his appetite is greater, better. This is a man who restrains himself is better than a man who conquers a city. In other words, a personal restraint is what proves. The strength of a man is proven by his personal restraint, not his achievements. You may take over a city. You may conquer a city, but true con conquest in God is personal conquest when you overcome yourself. It's another thing to overcome other thing, other people and another thing to overcome yourself. Now, the Bible here says, take your everyday, your ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work life, and your walking around. Those of you who love your dogs and walking around, walking to the park, right? you're going to the gym, you're walking around life, you're going to work, you're sleeping, you're eating, and place it before God. As an offering, I am telling you, when we talk about the language of offering, we are now, we have to bring the altar into perspective. That's why I told you there are physical or stationary altars and invisible altars. The throne of God is an invisible altar, a place of supernatural transaction which is not seen by the physical naked eye. So now, most, why is the church dying out? Because the place of sacrifice is the place of true worship. You see, worship is not the music and the songs that we sing. There are many singers that have never worshipped. Because whenever the word worship comes into perspective, it is connected with the sacrifice. Sacrifice has to do with you denying something that you love to the uh, to, uh, at the expense of something that you love more than what you are given now the word worship does not suffice or appear in the bible until when god tells abraham to go and sacrifice his only son isaac that's one when you read your bible 
the word from Genesis chapter 1. There is no word worship until Genesis chapter 20. Um, is it chapter 22? When God tells Abram, 21 I believe. It says when it tells Abram from verse 21, verse round about verse uh, 5 or 6. Let's look at it and you're going to see. God tells Abram this. Um, chapter, okay, chapter 22, I beg your pardon, 22, uh, Genesis chapter 22 from verse 5. That's when the word worship first suffices. Um, Genesis 22 and verse 5 goes like this. And remember the story. Um, if you read from verse 1, God told him, Take your son Isaac, whom you love the most, and sacrifice him to me. Um, in verse 3, Abram obeys and got up early in the morning and saddled his donkey. And he took two of his young servants and his son Isaac. He had split wood for the burnt offering. Are you hearing the word offering? Because God said, bring him to me as an offering. So he prepares the burnt offering. He set out for the place God had directed him. Verse 4. On the third day, he looked up and saw the place in the distance. Verse 5 says, And Abram told his two young servants, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I are going over there. I'm reading still from the Message Bible. Even if you turn it from into any version, you will still have the same thing there. The boy and I as they will go up there what? to worship. He says, the boy and I are going over there to worship. Then I will come back to you. Verse 6 shows you that the place of worship, if Abraham, as the Bible tells us in Isaiah, looking unto Abraham, the, what? the father of faith, looking unto Abraham, the, the rock from which you have been hewn. So in other words, you can't understand, pardon me, you can't understand your present and future until you look at the history. We need to understand this, that the Old Testament is in the new revealed and the new is in the old concealed. So this is, um, this is a typology of this action is a prophecy through a pattern or an event. There are prophecies in the Old Bible that, I mean, there are actions in the Old Testament that appear as patterns or events that are prophetic patterns. We have prophetic figures, shadows, patterns, and events that took place. Now, this action is a prophetic action pointing us to the future. We understand when theologians talk about eschatology, when you hear the, the theological term eschatology, eschatology is the science of the scripture or the interpretation of the scripture. The eschatology of the scripture points you into the future. The future. But for you to understand the future, you must understand the history. Now, in this history, there is an eschatological prophetic action that is pointing us to the future that abraham is only abraham the father a representation or a prototype of jehovah god the father gives his only son isaac as god the father would later in future give his only begotten son so that's why isaac is the very scripture that prophetically isaiah spoke about he was talking about in literally Isaiah 53 was referring to Isaac, although prophetically it was pointing us to Christ. So now in this prototype of figure that is now or event or prophetic action, which is in the past and we all claim we are believers descending from the father of faith, Abraham, looking unto Abraham, the rock from which you have been hewn, you understand? So now we need to understand that now there is, even in as much as there is a prophetic um, shadow or a prototype 
and a, a prophetic action pointing us to the future, so is it that everything that surrounds this premise, this principle here, that Abraham, as, um, as, 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 as um, the first believer, the father of believers, we see here, he takes his only begotten, I mean, his son, and says, I'm going there to worship. Brothers and sisters, to God it is not worship until it has cost you something. That's why the word worship, you can't separate, the place of the altar is a place of worship. Now, worship has nothing to do with what we say, but worship has everything to do with how we conduct and live our lives. So here he says, let me, I and the boy are going yonder. We are going over there to worship because a place of worship, worship is personal. It must cost you. But remember, was Abraham going there to sing songs of praise? God had told him, take your only son. God called him, read verse and says, and yes, Abraham answered, said, yes, here I am, I'm listening. He says, take your dear son. I don't want anything that is not dear to you. Take that which is dear to you and go to the land of Moriah. Can I remind you that that place Moriah is the place later the Romans called Golgotha, the very same place Jesus was crucified. What a perfect God. That land of Moriah is later when the, the Romans took over, they, they named that place Golgotha, the place of skulls. It is the very same place God the Father later Hundreds of thousands of years, that's the same place Jesus is sacrificed, is, is, is crucified. What a perfect God. That's why when I look at the Bible, I see the perfection of God and I see it's not gimmicks, it's not, people may attack the Bible, but where I came from Islam, there's a lot of discrepancies in, in, in the Quran, in the, in, in, in the Arabic scriptures, but what a perfect God. You, I mean, people can't really, people can't pretend this much back in the day. I mean, people who never met even a, a, a Abram, but then a, 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 the same mountain Moriah. How could they have known Jesus descending from this lineage and be crucified on the same place? If it was named by Jews, you would have thought it is intentional. But it is named and it was a Roman way of punishing people. It's still on Moriah, mountain Moriah, later called Golgotha. So now, moving forward with that, this is, God says, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will show you, I will point out to you. So there is a designated place that God wants Abram to raise an altar and offer a sacrifice of what he loves dearly to him. So now when we get to talk about worship, it is worship now because it, it is costing Abram something. The word worship comes from the, from the word worth, an English word worth, W-O-R-T-H, worth. So we worship his worthiness, worthership. We worship God's worthership. Is he worth your gold? So whatever you consider of greater worth becomes your God. And that's why Jesus says, where the treasure is, the heart finds its bed. Your heart, what consumes and dominates your heart becomes the object of what you worship. And that's why he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away. Until you see the heart is the altar your initial altar where you sacrifice whatever you desire. So whatever tags your heart has your attention and becomes the object of your worship. Whatever dominates and influences your heart is what determines your direction. So that's why God doesn't know it is worship until you have given him the heart. The battle here the supernatural battle hinges on who has the heart. The devil has, pardon me, has set up everything in the world to ensure the battle for your heart. Who has the attention 
of your heart. That's why let me define because I believe definitions determine interpretations. You see, worship is a dynamic. It is power that is born out of a vibrant relationship that one has with God minus singing. Can I repeat myself? Worship is a dynamic. It is power that is born out of a vibrant what do I mean vibrant? Lively relationship, authentic relationship that one has with God minus singing. So when worship is dead, God is dead in a generation. Of, although God does not die, but you understand the dichotomy that I'm using here to indicate that, you see, when worship is dead in a generation, that is the death of God in that generation because most people don't understand that worship must cost you something. Abram, God says there, he says, I am the boy. This is the first time the word worship appears. It must cost you something. Now there are people that have come to God. That's why you study the scriptures and look at um, look at the key events that take place in every aspect of scripture to, for you to understand the message of the master. Why would you think that when people were giving offerings in the temple, Jesus chose to go by the altar and he looks and he looks at how much everybody's putting into that basket because he, and, and then he says, this woman the widow has outgiven everybody, yes, because all oh, everybody gave reservedly out of the abundance they had, they gave reservedly, but she had her only one button, one termite, and that's ordinarious, and she gave it all. And by the way, she's a widow. In other words, she lost she lost uh, the source of her sustenance and covering. But she and she's a poor old widow, but she gave her all. Why? Because God meant her. God was all to her. And Jesus said she has outgiven everybody. Why does he stand by the altar to measure? Because it is at the altar and how men give themselves that that is the measure of a man's devotion and dedication to God is connected to his treasure. Can I repeat? The measure and the quality of a man's devotion is proportionate to the degree that he gives his whatever is, is measured to the degree of his detachment from anything that he values and thinks is of greater, is, is of greater worth. Until you sacrifice what you love the most, what you love dearly, to the one you love the most. Until you sacrifice what you love dearly to the one you perceive to love the most, you are not worshipping. So to the death of worship in a generation, that's why you see that our generation has sung so much, but there is no God. Why? Because the place of worship is a place of death. Show me your death and I'll show you your worship. Death to self is a place where you detach, you die to your desires, you die to your opinions. Because anybody, it is your sacrifice that gives you a voice. It is not, you see, worship is what proves the faith. And the faith in God is a relationship. It's a relationship. So the quality of your relationship is proportionate to the quality of your worship. The quality of your worship is measured by the quality of your sacrifice. What has it cost you? Everybody can sing. Everybody can show up in church. And what is your sacrifice? What has it cost you? So when, that's why Jesus says, these people honor me with the lips. It is easy. Lip service is easier. 
but it is in the living and not just in the speaking. That's why what gives a voice to your prayer altar is your personal sacrifice. That's why Paul urges you, present your body a living sacrifice, a holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of worship. So, reasonable worship, acceptable, recognizable worship in heaven is connected to your surrender. So, and we have seen what it is to present your body. It is your everyday life. Who owns your everyday life? You're going to work. You are working wherever you're working. How are you using your, your, how are you using your place of work to display the kingdom? He says, take your going to work life. Take your eating life in your eating. There are certain people when you call a fast, they get mad. Why? Because they love eating more than they love God. Many people have eaten their destinies away. It says, take your eating life, your drinking life. Now you get to a place and you find a Christian say, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm still, um, I'm here, you know. Um, 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 you see, I love God, yeah, but, um, you know, um, uh, you, you know, uh, but I, this, you have been born again for, all these years, you're still a drunkard, you drink. Now, when you tell people like this, they begin to say, oh, you're being judgmental. No, that's not being judgmental. God addresses wrong as wrong. He says, rather be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't get drunk on new wine. When I went to Kenya, I found most of the people, until even today, loads of pastors there drink. Drink. And believers thought drinking alcohol is fine. Why? What? Because if the altar is a place of sacrifice, let, me, let us define who a God is. You know, a small God or a big God. Now, let, who is a man's God? You know, a lot of people claim God is their God. That's why Jesus says many claim, Lord, Lord, is a claim. Don't they claim, they're worthy claiming. It, it is a, a lip service which is not in actual reality. To many, God is a principle. They follow God in principle but not in practice. It's another thing to follow God in principle but not in practice. You, you know the principle pertaining to God but the practice is missing. So here... Uh, that's why Jesus Christ is not just Jesus, he's Lord, to, he's Savior and Lord. So worship takes place, Jesus is the one that saves you by his grace, not by your works, by grace you are saved. But after Jesus has saved you, there is what we call Lordship. The first initial, the Savior, he saves you by grace and not by your works, but when it comes to lordship, good works are a, pr a proof that I have been saved by grace. It is not works that make me to be acceptable before God, but good works are proof of my honor to God. I, God does not accept me because I've done good. Whether I've done good or bad, God still accepts me. He loves me unconditionally. Let me break it down to you. God's love for you is unconditional, but his promises to you are conditional. Can I repeat? God's love for you is unconditional. Whether Let me break it in sim. I'll give you an example. Whether you tithe, you don't tithe. Whether you pray or you don't pray, God loves you the same way unconditionally because his love is not conditional, but his promises to you are conditional. Take for instance, you love God, but you don't tithe. His promise to prosperity, his promise to you for prosperity is conditional to your final, to your obedience, to your giving. There is a principle coded 
there is a principle coded in giving. It says, a generous soul shall prosper. Whether Muslim has done it, whether a, a believer does it, it is a principle. Principles, what are principles? Principles are a set of rules and laws which regulate function to life. They were fa which control, regulate, control the way life functions. Now, there is a principle, there are natural principles, there are spiritual principles. May take, for instance, there is a principle of gravity, natural law, principle. Principles are a set of rules and laws which regulate function to life, hence gravity. You may be so righteous, you may be the most holiest guy that has ever lived on this planet Earth, and you may even be in a hundred or a thousand years of fasting and you climb on you climb um on the uh, uh, on the tallest building in london and you jump you will crash land you will not fly you will you will crash land no why because although why because gravity is a natural principle that is set in place for you to continue to enjoy life and to live longer your longevity is subjected to your adherence or your compliance to that law of gravity you comply it doesn't care it's neutral whether you're wicked whether you are bin laden some or some are bin laden whether you're the most holiest thing that has ever existed on planet earth whether you are the righteousness of god in christ or your some are bin laden when you go on the on the two on the on, on the rooftop on a, of, an, of any build of any building and you jump you crash land the law the natural principle of gravity the law of nature is neutral similarly or equally when we speak about spiritual principles they are neutral that's why you find i came from an islamic family Muslims they tithe when it comes to annual you, they, we, we used to tithe or they tithe annually it's called zakat R zakat paying your tithe is called zakat it's one of the third pillars of uh, one of the fifth pillars of Islam is the third one praying five times a day <laughs> you know believing that there is one God and Muhammad is his messenger praying five times a day paying your zakat Paying your tithe is one of the five pillars of Islam. So, and guess what? When it comes to a believer to pay your tithe, it is the sheikhs that come to your business with their book and they ask you, the day your sheikh is coming into your business to collect tithe, you must put all the books and the transactions, annual transactions, what, and you put them there. He's the one like an accountant taking an audit to determine how much profit you made. And then after he has calculated all and the profits you have made, he tells you this is how much you are going to give to Allah. No wonder you see them in business. They are following a principle because principles are neutral. They regulate. They are encrypted with, uh, with, uh, with either reward or punishment in the laws. So these principles, I'm not talking, when you talk to Christians, I'm, I'm not under the law. I'm not talking about that law, the law of sin. I'm talking about the principles. So here we are, that you're um, going back to what I'm, I was saying, that God loves you so much, but you do not adhere to this principle. God's love to you is unconditional. Whether you give, you don't give. He loves you the same way. He's, I mean, he loves you madly. But guess what? <laughs> but his promises to your prosperity are conditional. So you keep eating the tithe, you, you, keep, you keep blocking your prosperity. And generosity, giving to others, contributing to others, it's a principle that unlocks your blessings. So, but that's why you can be the, the beloved but poor child of God. Why? He loves you unconditionally, but his prosperity, your prosperity, is conditioned to your obedience to a promise. And that's why I will say to you this. God loves you unconditionally. Keep sleeping around. Oh, even though, let me tell you something. Even though you decide to fornicate all this and you dedicate 2022 to fornication, to sleeping with everything that you see before you, guess what? Oh, God, the way God loves you 
It, sleeping around doesn't change the way God loves you. He loves you whether you sleep around or you don't sleep around. Are you hearing me? He loves you the same way, the way he loves anybody that is not sleeping around. But hear this, but your protection is, your God loves you. His love and for you is unconditional. His protection to you is conditional. Why? Are you paying attention? He loves you, go sleep around. But to protect you from STDs, huh? you, are the, you may be the beloved child of God, but with HIV AIDS. You may be with other STDs, with chlamydia. But you are the beloved child of God. Why? His protection is conditional. His love to you is unconditional. But his promises, the promise of protection is conditional. There has to be an understanding of how the things function. So now we are talking here. I'm laying a ground for you to understand the premise of altars. So here, which is connected to worship, there is a misconception that most of us think, you know, that's why when worship dies in a generation, God dies in a generation. That's why we, why? How do we know worship is dead? Because listen, worship is, um, to, now we say, you came to talk about altars. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Because the altar is a place of sacrifice. And for God, sacrifice is worship. Because worship is the offering of self to God. The crucifixion of self that God understands as a reasonable act of worship. So now, let me say this. Worship, true worship does this. Do you know that, that after this incident, it's when it was accredited unto Abraham as righteousness through faith? But guess what? Because righteousness is bestowed. Righteousness is a person of God. It's not something that we do it's an imputation of himself to us. But guess what? What does that show you? That incident takes place when a man dies and then God lives in a man. There's a, we call it, of course, in the New Testament, substitution. Now, where Christ died and I, and I no longer, I died with Christ, I had no longer live, now he lives. But in that process, I have to go through a death, not a claimed death, not a confessed death. I must start confessing it, but walking into that reality. Why? Because worship is a, is a two-edged two sword. Worship is a two-edged sword. What do I mean? Worship leaves, true worship leaves the imprint of the one being worshipped upon the worshipper, nature. The imprint, the nature of the one being worshipped upon the worshipper. Yeah, and at the same time, the other, the other side, the worshipper attaches worth, puts worth. That's why I told you the word worship comes from the word Worship comes from the word worthership, worth, worthership. So you put worth just like a phone, your mobile, you load it with airtime or bundles or data, whatever you call it. You can't call someone until you attach credit. The word credit is worth. It, uh, uh, the other synonym for credit is worth. So it, your phone is not function until it has worth, until you put worth, credit, credit is worth. So your worship is not consummated when there is no worth attached. You now the worshipper, the true worship adds value, worth on the one being worshipped as the one being worshipped begins to release his imprint, attaches his imprint, his nature upon God. There's a, a scripture, look it out for me in Psalms. Is it Psalms what? 
Is it Psalms 145 or Psalms 1? It says that it talks about the idols, that those who create them, I mean, those who bow down to the idols, those who worship them, look like them. You look like what you worship. The imprint of, the, of what you attach value upon is what come, will come upon you. You look like what you worship. Because worship has the dynamic, the capacity to release the imprint of whatever you're worshiping upon you. Now, this is why you see there's been a lot of songs in our generation, but there is no, there is no Christ-like character. That's why people question out the, the presence of the church in the governments, in the community. Why? We make a lot of noise, but there's no impact. Because when worship is dead, God is dead in a revelation. No, sorry, is dead in a generation. So therefore, the altars are undermined and the devil begins to laugh. God, Abram says that I may worship over there. There is that, that place is a personal place. He tells his servants, you stay here because what? The place of my sacrifice is personal to me. And it is through worship that a personal imprint of faith is released. Every man has his personal signature of faith, which is connected to his personal devotion and the death with God. Stay here. That's a place you don't take anybody. Now, until you sacrifice your sexual desires, until you sacrifice your love for the money, you know, until you sacrifice your reputation, you there are people that have are over reputation. Let me tell you, God, <laughs> the first thing Jesus made himself, the scripture says Jesus made himself of no reputation. Let me ask, what reputation is there? for people that go to Mount Moriah. You go there to, I mean, Moriah, Mount, and Mount Golgotha is a place where criminals were crucified. Is there any reputation of a thief? A thief, a criminal's one was lost re reputation. So Jesus was crucified like, as a, though he was not a criminal, he was crucified as a criminal, counted as a sinner, though he was not a sinner. So that a sinner, though not righteous, may be, may be counted as though. That's Romans 5.21. Second, no, 2 Second Corinthians, I believe. 5.20.21. Though he knew no sin, he became sin. That those, so, so that even these ones that are, were not sinners, I mean were sinners, would be considered counted as though they are righteous though in it, though in actual reality they are not it is his righteousness just as he himself was not a sinner and it was our sin that put him there so we need to understand the law of substitution there so then we have fake substitution existing which God calls it hypocrisy. Walking in the dark, walk in the light as is in the light so you may have fellowship with one another. Transparency, authenticity brings us to a deeper place of fellowship with each other and with God. And then the blood of Jesus is activated to cleanse. But where hypocrisy exists on our personal walk with God, then the blood of Jesus is nullified to do its work. I didn't say that. The Bible has told you in 1 John 1, 7, that the blood of Jesus cleanses those that come out of the shadows of satanic assault, guilt, and condemnation, but, and they come into the light of his radiance, come and be authentic, and then and they, we come to that place of authenticity in recognition of his love and mercy and grace, and say, I'm helpless, but your grace can, and then once they come in there and admit in the light of his love and mercy, then the blood of Jesus cleanses them from all other sins and every sin but now we're talking about worship here 
connected to the altar. So Abram, Bible says, verse 6, Abram took the wood for the burnt offering and gave it to Isaac, his son, to carry. <laughs> he carried, you see, as Jesus carried his own cross to the place of death, you see the, the, the shadow here, the prophecy through a shadow, an event. It says he carried the, the flint and the knife. Isaac carry, I mean, Abram carries the, uh, the flint and the knife. The two of them went together. What you love the most must go. What you love dearly, you, it must go with you to the place of sacrifice. You can't leave it behind. That's why Jesus stands by the basket to weigh the hearts of men. You truly don't know. You can truly tell whether people love God when it comes to, when it take, demands a, a certain aspect of them to be detached, to release your pure life, you know, release your impure life in exchange for pure living, re re release your money to build his kingdom. When they talk about money, most people begin, uh, now they, hmm, they, they're asking for money. Listen, an altar is a place where you sacrifice what you love the mo what you love dearly to the one you love the most. Now, let me give you before in the eight minutes that are here because I was just laying the foundation. Now, the use of altars is, is um, as old as the existence of man. We look at this in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. The altar suffices in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. And the Bible says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of garden. Um, um, of, amongst the trees of um, of the garden. Now, the Garden of Eden was a kind of of altar man regularly. Uh, was a, uh, the Garden of Eden, I was saying, was a kind of um, altar where God met with and fellowshiped with man regularly. A place, kind of an altar where God met with man and fellowshiped with man regularly. So God would also come. The Bible reports as you read the scripture, it shows us that God would also come at a particular time of the day, which was in the cool of the day to fellowship with man. He didn't come anywhere else, but the designated place Eden is an altar. A place of fellowship. This means that at Eden, we have a place. And then at Eden, we have a time of fellowship between God and man. You see, you don't, the problem with why there is no discipline in the lives of many Christians is because there is absence of discipline when it comes to fellowship with God. Abram, there was a specific place and a time of fellowship between God and man. Most people just pray hap hap haphazardly. Haphazardly, hmm? they just pray hap uh, haphazardly. They don't have, uh, when do they, when, boom, 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 boom. Yes, we must maintain a 24-hour 7 meditational and uh, of course prayer, but you don't pray haphazardly. You consecrate a moment with God. You know you want God to talk to you on a deeper level. Most of you that heard me by the grace of God, telling you how God revealed to me this disease before it even came. And he spoke to me about COVID-19, and he spoke to me about the vaccines before they even, even anybody spoke about there will be vaccine. I was talking about the disease connected to a vaccine. How the Lord revealed it to me. But now, you can't live a haphazard life, a spiritual indisciplined life, and you, you expect God to talk to you on a deeper level. God came to have fellowship. We see that in Genesis. 
Have you ever asked yourself why Exodus chapter 25, as soon as these guys had left Egypt, now they are in the desert. What's the first thing that God tells them? He tells Moses in Exodus 25, Moses, collect an offering. Tell Israel, every man, to give an offering uh, from his heart. We only collect an offering from those with willing hearts. And what did God say? And have them build me a sanctuary. A, 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 a tabernacle. What's a tabernacle? A tabernacle is a place of meeting with God. And I have them. The people didn't have after their salvation. They have been delivered from the devil Pharaoh. Now as they come over there in that space. God says collect an offering from them. They don't know that when God made them favorable before the Egyptians. And they gave them gold, they gave them mirrors, they gave them cow skins dyed red, everything silver, wood. You ask yourself in the desert, they have, God did not ask anything in terms, when you look at the stones he's asking and all the, the, the kind of materials he asked of these people to give, he had already supplied and given them what was needed to build himself a sanctuary as a temple as a place of meeting for them and God was very specific he says because I want to meet them in this place have you seen what he said it was very specific why did God verse 8 you see where he makes his intentions clear he says you are to construct he says let them construct a sanctuary for me. Do you see Exodus 25, 8? Let them construct a sanctuary for me so that I can live among them. That is them. That's what the, uh, this, what's it called? The message Bible says. But when you go into the King James, it says this, uh, 8. And let them make, um, uh, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them them that I may fellowship I will dwell among them these people did never knew that they had they were liberated they never knew they had need for fellowship with God but what did God show them God is that the tabernacle is God's heart that desires to have fellowship with man so God said bring Akashia wood ask yourself in the desert these were slaves where would they get acacia wood, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense, the onk stones, and all the gems of to, of be, to be mounted on the ephod and the breast, a breast piece of, you know. God exposed them, and he made them favorable before the Egyptians. They didn't know that whatever God was exposing them to whatever opportunity God was giving them to he was later to require for them to come and give an offering in order for a sanctuary to be built and a place to consult cons so the so this tabernacle is a sum total of the sacrificial givings of these people and they're saying lord although this gold was given to me in egypt but god you are you are worth more your glory is worth more than the gold there's a saying that give him the gold <laughs> worth of his glory so he, moses has told them sacrifice so today i close with this teaching today and i will close with these remarks after man was expelled from the garden of eden why because of disobedience men like seth man like seth blessed the trial in calling upon god do you remember Seth in the Bible? He was the man, he pioneered the trail in calling upon God, obviously through worship, through worship altars. 
And you say, is it true? Yes. And the Bible says in Genesis 4.26, it says, And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. A man called Enoch was known to be a walking altar. Enoch was a walking altar who had fellowship with Jehovah God, a walking altar of Jehovah. And the, the Bible says to you as I close if he, um, Genesis 5.24, And Enoch walked with God and he was no more, for God took him. He walked with God and literally God carried, I mean, God carried him wherever he went. He carried God. Enoch carried God wherever he went until the man was no more. God is looking for God carriers in this generation. And allow me today for just an introduction of in the understanding of the altars. I hope you have been blessed. Is the church here? <laughs> Pastor Guma. Yes, we have been blessed. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Where's Pastor Guma? I'm here. Go ahead and, and, and pray for us and close. Sir. That's what that was an amazing introduction. If that's an introduction, I don't know what the main <laughs> subject is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I'm t actually, to be honest, it's just an introduction, and in itself as an introduction, mm. it has not reached even, um, if you're measuring 1 up to 10, the introduction hasn't even been, um, hasn't even been to 2 out of 10. Amen and amen. <laughs> come on, people, let's appreciate Apostle Moses for this awesome uh, teaching. Come on, come on, go ahead, go ahead. Hallelujah, God. hallelujah. So go ahead and, 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 and pray and, 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 and close this session today. Amen. There's a saying in Leviticus 6, 9, I'm reading from the Amplified Classic. It says, command Aaron and his sons, saying, mm. this is the law of the burnt offering. Mm. The burnt offering shall remain on the altar all night until morning. The fire mm. shall be kept burning on the altar. Mm. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out. Keep the fire burning on the altar. Yeah. In Revelation, we'll see tomorrow, there's still an altar revealed and the altar represents prayer whenever you find it. So what I would pray for us is that God, I want you to pray for yourself and say, Father, ignite your fire. Ignite your fire upon my prayer altar. Give me passion for you in the name of Jesus. My Father, by the power of your grace, remember the grace of God that empowers you. Father, empower me by the power of your grace to offer my body a living sacrifice. Remember, it is by the masses of God. It is by the grace of God. Tell him, tap into that grace and say, Father, this morning I receive the grace. I activate the grace to die in areas and to give up the places that I had not given up to him, given up or surrendered to you. Let by the power of your grace, those places be given to you in the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and say, Spirit of the living God, overshadow me, baptize me afresh with a fresh fire. Let let fresh fire fall upon my prayer altar. My Father, my Maker, let fresh fire fall afresh upon my prayer altar in the name of Jesus Christ. All those areas you've heard about, begin to surrender them to God and say, Lord, I surrender this. I surrender this. This is where I've been finding struggle. The Bible says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. I beg your pardon. Yeah, um, um, Hebrews 4, 16. It says, there are four brethren, uh, uh, Come boldly to the throne of grace that you may receive mercy and then find grace to meet you at your point of need. Mercy 
must for you to to receive mercy you must recognize failure because mercy is unlocked when a man recognizes the areas of failure you recognize lord i failed here that's why i need that's why i come to receive mercy you say lord that's why i need your mercy because i'm a gossip lord i need your that's why i appropriate mercy today today i receive mercy in the area of failure you tell him lord i failed here and i've been failing here that's why i'm a I'm, uh, I am a, I am a beneficiary of this mercy. Lord, I thank you for this mercy. I receive mercy in the area of pride. Lord, in the name of Jesus. Then you find grace. My Father, now today I find grace to help me. In this area that you have acknowledged, you say, Lord, I find grace. Today, in Jesus' name, I find grace. Let the grace of God to stand. Let the grace of God to overcome these issues be activated as I pray. In the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, my Father. Thank you, my Maker. Father God, I bless the lives of your children today. I thank you, Father God, because we know the place of the throne of grace is an altar, the place of exchange. Open your mouth and say, Lord, today I exchange my weakness for your strength. That's why I have come on this altar, because it is in your presence that I am perfected and beautified. Open your mouth and tell them, Lord, as I live, beautified, because I've presented my body, I've sacrificed, I've taken my sleep and I've given you my sleep you said I should take my sleeping life my eating life tell him Lord today I surrender to you my eating life. Most of us at the Rebuilders House, we are in 14 days of fasting and prayer. We have started today, every five days of the week, until the 23rd of December. Now, we, what are we doing? We are giving our eating life. So you tell them, Lord, I give my sleeping life. I give my eating life to you. I have come to the place of exchange. Lord, I give my weakness for your strength. I give my foolishness for your wisdom. Lord, I tap into your wisdom in the name of of Jesus, I tap into, I give you my eyes that cannot see far, that you may give me your eyes that are unlimited, your eyes that can see beyond the walls. I give you my ears that I have come. I bury my ears right now on this altar so that I may take your ears, the ears that are able to perceive, to see beyond the natural limitations and to hear beyond the natural limitations. My Father, my Maker, in the natural I am limited. That's why I come to you, the unlimited God so that the extraordinary virtues, your virtues will overshadow me, that even as I leave and I go to work, I will do exceedingly abundantly above all that I think and imagine. In the name of Jesus, Father, whatever had died in the lives of your children, let it come back to life in the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and say, Lord, I thank you because I am not the same. I thank you because I've received your strength. Thank you, Jehovah God, because I go to work in the strength you provide. This morning I have received strength to overcome and to dominate sin. Ah, sin, you're no longer dominant over me. Sin, you no longer have dominion over me. I have overcome. I receive the anointing today on this altar to go and conquer whatever it is that the devil had set in motion against my life and family in Jesus' name. There Therefore, we declare together and we say the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the blessed Holy Spirit is with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely goodness and mercy, prosperity, favor, protection, exceeding glory of God follows us so the days of our lives as we continue to dwell in the presence of the Lord now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Invite somebody else tomorrow. This week is bombarded and we're going to be blessed in Jesus. Amen.